That's supposed to be a two. God's Not Dead 2 was directed by Harold Kronk and stars Melissa Joan Hart, David A.R. White, Haley Arensha, as well as some of the rest of the cast from the first God's Not Dead movie. Andre Wise, he plays a lawyer. And this is a sequel to the first God's Not Dead movie that came out in 2014. Now, the first God's Not Dead movie was made at a meager $3 million budget or so, and it blew up at the box office. It made a lot of money, had a lot of popularity, especially with Christian audiences. All of those people were all over that first movie. So naturally, a couple of years later, a sequel, God's Not Dead 2, would come out in 2016 with a slightly higher budget and still made a lot of money at the box office. Much more popularity from the same kind of Christian audiences. A lot of people like this movie. I know many of my my Christian friends liked this movie and they were just going after it and they were recommending it to everybody. So we have our sequel to this movie, It Too Made Lots of Money, and coming out at the end of March, we'll have God's Not Dead 3. Yeah, there's three of them now. And this is the second movie in this now God's Not Dead series. And this is the movie about the high school teacher, Mrs. Grace Wesley, AP history teacher, giving a normal lecture in her history class about Martin Luther King Jr. and Gandhi, how they were peacemakers at their time. And then a student named Brooke raises her hand and asks about Jesus. Grace is a somewhat withdrawn Christian, but she goes ahead and answers the question anyway. And she explains that Jesus was a historical figure who was connected to his own peace movement, similar to Martin Luther and Gandhi. And she explains further with some Bible scriptures and some more context from the Bible about Jesus. Then a different student in the class texts about the incident that Jesus was mentioned in the classroom and soon enough the entire school board is coming down on Wesley how she talks about Jesus in the classroom kind of blowing things out of proportion how she shared her faith and she's going against the school policy and she mentioned Jesus in the classroom is going against school policy she can't do that because it's against school policy and all the parents are going to come down on the school because she talked about Jesus in the classroom it's all against school policy. <laughs> They ask Wesley to apologize for talking about her faith and to not share her faith again in the classroom setting. But Wesley doesn't apologize. She doesn't see any need to apologize. She was just answering a student's question with some of her faith knowledge that she thought was pertinent to the question and pertinent to the lecture, that she was just stating facts and not actually pressuring her faith onto the class. Nonetheless, the school board disagrees, and then we have a courtroom drama that runs as a central conflict for the rest of the movie. Now, this movie is based on numerous court cases in which teachers have been called out for sharing their faith in the classroom as part of a lecture or to try to lean students toward their Christian faith and then they're called out because they should have kept their faith out of the classroom that their students and their kids had no business learning about Christian faith outside of what the subject in the classroom is. Many, many different cases have happened and stems because of these kind of troubles with faith in the classroom and that the faith in the classroom part should have been apart from each other and that this, it was inappropriate for the teacher to talk about it at all. God's Not Dead 2 is essentially the continuation of the classic God's Not Dead formula as established in the first movie where somebody in the classroom brings about their faith either as part of the lecture or to maybe disagree with something that somebody in the classroom said. A disagreement comes about because the Christian faith was shared in the classroom and a conflict comes out of that whether it looks like a debate in the first movie or an entire court case in the second movie. Meanwhile there are a few supporting characters on the side that take up their own individual subplots. Each character with their own personal issues that they're dealing with. There's definitely a pastor in these movies who might come to foster the faith of the main character going through the conflict of the film. The main faith based conflict in the film continues and the supporting characters are still dealing with their personal issues until about the third act or so when faith finally starts to come into play and the con and the main conflict in the film start sort of starts to resolve itself and even the enemy and the main conflict starts to learn the lessons about the faith that the main character is trying to give and the supporting characters reaching rock bottom effectively are starting to learn about are starting to learn about God and how God can foster to their personal issues. Then of course we have the newsboys who have their big concert at the end who some of the characters might attend and then they give their big message to text everybody that people in the audience know to text them God's not dead and to share this message with everybody that they know. And that's the school of God's not dead. And God's not dead too sort of continues where we left off from the subplots in the first movie. Amy was first diagnosed with cancer and she consults the newsboys for prayer and now after a brief visit with the doctor she is now cancer free thanks to all the prayers that she's gotten. And then later in the movie as the court trial continues for the teacher Brooke consults Amy 
me for some faith advice and for some emotional support as her teacher is going through the trial. Pastor Dave is still at his church and the Chinese boy Martin consults him with over 100 questions that he has about God. Pastor Dave is at breakfast with some of the church leaders and a government official comes in and informs them all that they need to send in their sermon notes to the government to be inspected over and looked at if it's actually appropriate to be talked about, I suppose. The pastor goes to a government office, turns in a thin folder of his sermon notes, which is actually a letter over how absurd the whole order is. He leaves the office and gets some side pains. Then later on in court, he, the whole jury sits down, he stays standing, gets worse side pains, collapses, gets put on a stretcher, and later on in the hospital, he has appendicitis. And his subplot just kind of goes on and on, and all the different subplots that the second movie is trying to hold up just goes on and on. And this probably brings me to the main issue that I have with this movie, and that is continuing the main issue that the first movie had and which is trying to hold on to multiple subplots and all these multiple supporting characters who are supposed to hold up the theme of faith who are supposed to bring in their own experience of faith and help the audience learn more about God and help the audience learn more about prayer and how effective prayer and the faith is to these supporting characters and everything just gets really discombobulated and intercut way too often I think this movie probably had a worse issue with intercutting all the different unnecessary subplots and unnecessary supporting characters now I'm not really expecting the sequels to learn from any of the issues that they may or may not know that they brought up in the first movie, but I'm really not surprised that the same issues from the first movie carry on into the second movie with the subplots and just way too much stuff going on and way too many issues and way too many points of view on the theme is going on in the second movie. It's great that the court case, the main conflict of the movie, is still being the main drive of the whole movie. I was more eager to cut back to the court case and see how things are going in the trial for Wesley, but there's still so much intercutting to other characters who I still don't really know yet or still don't really care about yet and they're still trying to interject their own personal experiences and still trying to interject their own elements of the story and their own elements of the theme that this movie is trying to add up together to show something like how great God is or how great God is to administer to all these different characters. And it's, it, it was still leaving me really scramble brain. It was still leaving me really confused. I kept losing track of all the different scenes as I felt in the first movie. It was still just too much fluff and too much unnecessary stuff that was kind of dragging the film down and pulling our attention away from the main real conflict going on the movie in the courtroom to pull us aside to these supporting characters and what they're learning about the faith and how they are kind of trying to contribute to the main conflict. It was all just distracting and just way too much going on and it's definitely the re and it's definitely the real repeating issue happening in this sequel. I will give the movie a compliment for Melissa Joan Hart for her good performance as the teacher, Mrs. Grace Wesley. She played a good teacher. She was sympathetic. She was friendly. She liked to work with the kids and teach the class. There really weren't any stereotypes in this movie, thankfully. There weren't any stereotypes surrounding Grace Wesley as a teacher. There weren't any stereotypes around her as a Christian. She wasn't trying to be entitled. She wasn't trying to assert her right to teach Christianity or to say that Christianity is the one truth in this movie. She hit the right notes in terms of emotions. She hit the right notes of confusion and distress and emotional uncertainty as a school board comes down on her and accusing her of sharing Jesus at the wrong times in the wrong place. When she's in the courtroom, Wesley shows clear signs of distress. She shows clear signs of the weight and the vulnerability that's on her as she's trying to withstand the trial and keep herself confident as a Christian and maintain her title and job as a teacher. Everybody is pointing fingers at her. Everybody is putting their blame on her. The public, the governments, the media, people in the court system, people in the education system are putting their blame on her. And I give her a lot of credit for showing all the emotions, for showing all the tears that her character would go through and all of the distress and upset moments that someone in her position would go through, and especially as a teacher and especially someone in her position. Outside of all that, Goth Not Dead 2 is essentially a Goth Not Dead sequel, sort of an overly bloated, overly preachy sequel to the first movie that's just as bulky with plot and characters and just as bulky with preachy themes. So due to all of that, like its predecessor, I would give God's Not Dead 2 a D. <laughs> There was a lot to unpack in this movie. There was a lot to unpack in terms of the theme, in terms of the scenes, in terms of all the different characters that they're trying to include in this movie, in terms of the writing, in terms of just all the stuff that they're still trying to put into this movie. But, uh, yep, thank you so much for watching this. Thank you for watching my review on now the second installment on this God's Not Dead series. This month is actually turning into a bit of March Madness for me, not in terms of basketball, but actually in terms of movies, as there are four Christian movies coming out this month in March, and that's more Christian movies and I am usually able to pay attention to or more Christian movies and actually come out each month that I'm going to try to go out and watch and try to review those movies including Paul Apostle of Christ, Mary Magdalene, 
I can only imagine, and Goss Not Dead 3, which naturally I think I have already promised since I've reviewed the first two movies. I'm going to be going out to watch that movie and review it as it comes. All the rest of the movies, I'm going to do the best I can to go out, go out and watch them and review them as I'm able to watch them. So uh, yeah, those are the plans I have. And tentatively, my goal at the end of the month is to watch and review a couple of Jesus movies leading up to a surprise review or two on Easter Sunday and the first week of April. I'll try to include a couple of friends that I want to have co-hosting with me for those reviews. Thanks for watching and until my next review, stay faithful to the movies.